So we're going to just uh, give people like one more minute and then we're going to get started. If you guys can see uh, right now that we're going to be doing uh, using poll everywhere a little bit uh, uh, further into the webinar. And so if you wanted to either go to this URL, the pollev.com, Kirshank Manager 031, um, or uh, you can download the app. You can either do that in your browser or download the app and then you'll put in Kirshank Manager 031 in order to be able to participate later. So I think that we're going to go ahead and get started because we wanna respect everybody's time. Um, so I'm going to begin. So this is our real first page here. Welcome to the spring 2023 community webinar by CureShank. Uh, we are super excited to tell you guys about what we have been doing and what we are going to be doing. And um, uh, we just can't wait to share. So I wanted to start with who CureShank is. And we wanted to emphasize, we are a volunteer army of parents whose children are living with the disastrous symptoms of Phelan McDermid syndrome. And we are determined to accelerate the development of treatments for this devastating neurodevelopmental disorder. That is our entire mission. That is our singular focus. So the approach that we have to this singular purpose is twofold. We identify and fund projects that are gonna overcome barriers to successful drug development. All of us have children who are suffering from the various symptoms of Phelan McDermid syndrome. And all, those of us in the community know um, that treatments cannot come soon enough and that there's so much room for improvement. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is figure out how do we get from point A to point B? How do we get from, there's a bunch of science that's been done um, about the Shank 3 gene, which is the main gene involved in Phelan McDermid syndrome. How are we going to get to the other side where we eventually have clinical trials and treatments? So we're trying to identify and then also provide funding for projects that'll help us do that. And we're also trying to coordinate scientific efforts to improve efficiency and speed. So we're gonna tell you more about that later, what that means. Um, but the, but the main idea is we all know that there are all sorts of things that we run into in our lives where things are not done as efficiently as possible. And so we are trying to help that in this particular circumstance. So doing all of this requires three main things. Um, it requires community engagement. You guys are all super important. It requires absolutely requires funding. And of course it requires collaboration with all the other organizations and people and companies and, and researchers who are all trying to work on various aspects of what is gonna help our kids. This is just one um, uh, thing from our, our website I wanted to share. Um, uh, these are some of our most important important partners. Some of them on here will be familiar to a lot of you, some of them not as familiar, but these are all um, organizations that are doing wonderful things that, um, are, you know, is, is helpful to our community. And if you go to our website where um, it says about us and you go to the part that says our partners, you can click on each one of these and learn more about each of these organizations. So tonight we are going to focus first on what we have done. We are going to sort of give you a 2022 impact report. Number two, we're going to be talking about what we're doing. Um, we have uh, what are our projects that we have in context so that you can understand how they all fit into the overall scheme of things. And then finally, how you can help Kirshank's mission. First, some housekeeping. Um, please use the Q&A chat to submit any questions. Um, we are hoping to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And um, we'll be using Poll Everywhere, as I mentioned before. Um, actually, I should have removed this bit right here. Sorry, the texting feature is not really working correctly. So um, just uh, do one of these two other ways. Go to the URL in your browser of pollev 
cureshankmanager.com forward slash cureshankmanager031. Or if you have the app, you can just put in cureshankmanager031. All right, so now we are getting ready to discuss what we've done. This is right here, our 2022 impact report infographic. This is the whole thing. It's There's a lot of different parts of it. And so we're going to break it down into smaller uh, parts as we discuss what we've done. So the bottom part here talks about two important things. Um, wh what we did for last year um, in terms of progress, in terms of accelerating the translation of research to therapeutics was a lot of legwork in setting up our biomarkers and outcome measures consortium. Um, that cost us about $100,000 in terms of all the things that we needed to do. We uh, retained a project manager and a legal team. We engaged with 22 potential industry partners, meaning companies that are either developing Shank 3 Therapeutics or are interested in doing so. And we also developed um, governance in terms of participation in our consortium. We're going to talk more about what this consortium does a little bit later because we have big plans for 2023. Um, but we just wanted you guys to understand that like this past year has been a ton of legwork getting us to the point that then we have these things that we're looking forward to doing in 2023. And of course, many of you guys are going to be familiar with the fact that um, we had two community webinars um, last uh, year. And uh, of course, one of the biggest things that uh, involved our community engagement is something else that we're going to talk about in just a minute. So if you look down here at the bottom, um, where we created two new real family stories videos, um, this is a part... Uh, and we'll, I'll discuss it on the next slide. This is a part of our patient-focused drug development real family stories because in it, there is a just a world of difference between see, hearing the phrase, let's see, the, our two uh, videos from last year were one on self-injurious behaviors and one on severe hypotonia. If you just see those words there, how much does that impact you emotionally, right? But when you see the story of a, an individual person here you see, this is my son, how, what he's done to his face. And when you see the story of little Avonlea, who has such hor horrific hypotonia and all the ways that it impacts her, um, this is not just meaningful to our community. It's meaningful to um, uh, people in companies that are developing this stuff in understanding that this is a real, really worthwhile endeavor. And um, it's also meaningful to investors in some of those companies and it's meaningful to the FDA. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's we, we consider this to be an important project, although it's not directly, you know, um, like a research project. Now, if you look in the middle here, um, you'll see the Phelan McDermott syndrome conceptual model. A lot of you guys will be familiar with this. Um, this was a project where we extracted data from 15 peer-reviewed publications, and we identified 96 disease signs and symptoms of Phelan McDermott syndrome, as well as 13 observer-reportable observer patient impacts and 31 caregiver impacts. And so some of you are familiar with seeing this on our website. Uh, we are working on making this more interactive, so it's not just a list of symptoms, but that we're going to be able to um, make it so that we, you can do more with this than just look at a printout. But you can see the scope of all of this. This this was not just listing a bunch of symptoms that we happened to think of as parents uh, of, of kids with Phelan McDermott syndrome. This is a, a, a very extensive survey of um, a like I said, 15 different peer reviewed uh, sources and, um, you know, everything was, um, it, it, it was, it was very professionally done. And so uh, we're working on making this uh, more interactive to make it um, easier to digest. Oh, and I should add that before I move on to the next thing is that the reason this conceptual model is important is because um, basically uh, companies that where, where nobody has done a conceptual model like this, companies are kind of like, oh, do we go into that space? I don't know. It's a barrier. Um, the FDA likes to see that you have done a conceptual model like this because they want to get a better idea of, okay, like what are all of the symptoms? What is up with this disorder? And so um, this is not just something that we did to compile information. This is very strategic. 
And the cost for that was $25,000. Um, and then of course, so many of you are aware that the biggest thing that we did um, in 2022 was our externally led patient focused drug development or ELPFDD meeting for Phelan McDermott syndrome uh, before the FDA. That was in November, and um, we had nearly 300 families participate in that. There were more than 150 written comments that were submitted, and we had attending live 13 companies, 30 researchers, and 16 FDA regulators. And of course, the recording is also available to um, lots of people uh, who were not able to attend live. The cost of this to us was $80,000. and. Um, uh, what I'm, what's going to come next is I'm going to play a little uh, four minute video that summarizes what that was all about, because it was a five it was a five hour uh, meeting and uh, we tried our best to sum it up in four minutes. Ethan faces more than most adults within an hour of waking up, but he gets on the bus to school every day with joy. Literally every person who meets him loves him. On Sunday, March 20th at 8 a.m., which is unusually late for Ethan, he was still quiet. Dan startled awake and found Ethan dead in his bed. He was six years old. Cure Shank's mission is to accelerate treatments for Phelan McDermott syndrome, a severe genetic disorder caused by changes to the Shank 3 gene. In 2022, we completed our biggest project to date, sponsoring an externally led patient-focused drug development meeting before the FDA. Today's meeting will serve to advance the development and regulation of new and better treatments for Phelan McDermott syndrome. This disorder affects thousands, including my son, Darius. Wanna try again? You're going to swallow or are you going to keep it in your mouth? At the FDA meeting, our stories were told. One of the biggest struggles for us is eating. Because of Hudson's motor planning delays and intellectual disability, she can't identify appropriate bite sizes. She's needed the high life more times in her life than any other child or parent should have to go through. No parent should have to do this over and over for their child. It was escalating. We bang his head on the floor, on the wall, on a door. He would hit his head with his fists. He might have a really huge meltdown, just had to like strain him. He was fighting and fighting and fighting to be able to get out of our grip so that he could hurt himself. Our fears for the future almost always revolve around seizures. Sudden unexpected death and epilepsy is very scary. And it happens very often. Our struggles heard. She broke into full-blown mania and psychosis. She saw witches in the tree branches and pleaded with us to cut the trees down. She began to believe that the people she misses so much are dead under rocks. She wept for hours saying, my heart is broken into little pieces. Ow, ow. And hope expressed. As Ricky's mother, I prepared to make sacrifices and take the necessary risks in trying new treatments because I'm unwilling to accept that this is it for my son. Of course, we would love to have a total cure for PMS, maybe a way to insert the missing piece of this 22nd chromosome into each cell of the body, but I suspect that is still a ways off. Nonetheless, we remain ever hopeful. I hope that these experiences that my family have navigated gives you a little insight into our lives. We deeply love Bennett and are trying our best to provide him with a good quality of life. The event was a resounding success and community engagement was record breaking. So being able to see her sleeping one, two, three nights continuously is like, oh, what would happen here? With over 200 families participating in polling questions and over 150 submitting comments. Live attendees included industry representatives from 13 companies, 30 researchers, 
and 16 FDA regulators. This whole day has been incredible. We've pulled back the curtain on Phelan McDermott syndrome. And it's because each and every one of you were willing to, to share the things that worry you every single day. For 2023, we have undertaken new important projects. We will not rest in our mission to accelerate treatments for the thousands living with Phelan McDermott syndrome. Give me one moment. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is not supposed to do that. Give me one second. Okay, we need to get out of here. Ethan Feast is more than most adults. All right, sorry about that, everybody. Technical yeah. issues seem to always hit us some, in some way. All right, so now we want to get on to uh, tell you about what we are doing. And I'm not going to be covering most of that, but I am going to introduce it. Um, we have three categories of projects in 2023. And of course, the biggest category is our project of bridging the Phelan McDermid syndrome translational research gap. More about that later or very soon, actually. But in order to do that, there are some important things that we have to do. One, we have to keep the focus on patients and caregivers. And in order to do that, we have to improve our way of communicating and engaging with the Phelan McDermott syndrome community. Um, it was uh, maybe harder than it should have been for us to uh, make the ELPFDD happen and made us realize um, uh, both PMSF and us that we need to figure out, um, you know, how are we engaging everybody? How are we changing with the times? Um, also, our projects require funding. Um, these things are not cheap. We do them as cheaply as possible, but this means that we have to improve our fundraising capabilities. And those two things are pillars that support the main objective of our organization, which is bridging this research gap so that we can get from the basic science to clinical trials. So first, I wanted to just um, talk with you a little bit about our communications uh, endeavors. Um, we want to enhance our ability to engage with the PMS community, like I said, to focus on patient-focused drug treatment and development. Um, also, we want to keep parents and caregivers informed about the scientific developments. I think that um, it is very empowering as a parent to be knowledgeable about what is going on as opposed to just sort of feeling like you have to sit on the sidelines and just like wait for the um, the scientists to come and tell you, here you go, we finally came up with something. And um, so we really take that very seriously. And also, we want to let parents and caregivers know how they can get involved, because I think that one of the best ways that a lot of us deal as parents with the hand that we've been dealt is to be able to throw ourselves into doing what we can to help. So how are we trying to improve our communication uh, with the Phelan McDermott syndrome community? Well, one is we want to improve our reach on Facebook and on other social media. So one thing that we are doing is we are creating a new Facebook group. Um, actually, we have created it. It's called Phelan McDermott Communications Kirshank. And the reason that we're doing this is because I don't know if uh, you guys have run into this, but if anybody that has a page for uh, like a, a Facebook page for a business or an organization has the same challenge, which is that posts that we put up just do not easily show up in people's news feeds. And first of all, we don't want to spend a ton of money on um, this. We want to spend our money on science, right? And um, and second of all, it's hard to really even use some of the paid advertising, even if we if we could, if, even if we had the money to do that, uh, to reach of such a specific community of, you know, people with have kids with Phelan McDermott syndrome primarily. And so what we decided to do is to create a group because group posts tend to show up more in people's news feeds. And so we're wanting to create this group so that if you join it, you basically join it saying, I want to hear about what's going on 
uh, with CureShank. I want to hear about opportunities to get involved. I want to hear about clinical trials, whatever it might be. So that is the purpose of this new Facebook group. Uh, the other thing that we've done is create a social media team, who, which are people who just will help to spread the word. When we, when we uh, post something on our page, they'll maybe share it on theirs. Um, and a community engagement committee, which helps with social media. And we'll talk a little bit later about how uh, they're also helping uh, with fundraising. The other thing we're trying to do is to assess what communication methods, and this is something we've discussed with PMSF um, as, as a need that we have in our community, is to figure out how do we better reach current PMS community members and how are we going to be reaching future PMS community members, because there is a, you know, a, a difference between like what kinds of uh, social media that um, people are using if you're 25 years old versus if you are 55 years old, right? And so we're trying to get a better handle on the best ways to do this. So this is where our um, poll everywhere uh, is going to come into play. I'm hopefully the technology is going to work here. Um, we have, this is going to be the, uh, I'm going to activate this survey um, and it enables you to answer the questions at your own pace, but then we'll be able to still share the results to the questions on here. So again, this is, I should have um, maybe, I'm trying to see if I can put it back here. Uh, in case you didn't get it before, pollev.com forward slash Cureshank Manager 031. Um, and, or if you have the app, just put in Cureshank Manager 031. And this should enable you to participate. Um, so now I'm going to go, oh, uh, why? oh, click on here. So we are going to do this. I'm going to activate this. And you should see on your end the ability to answer the questions. Um, and we're gonna look through the answers to some of these. Um, and um, we are going to, uh, I just wanna let you know, the first ones are about social media. Then we talk about um, co communicating like with you outreach. And then we're gonna get into some questions about um, a possible project that we're considering doing. So we have grouped the the uh, the questions here um, for, uh, be because, it's easier to see than all at once. So we're trying to get a sense of what social media uh, platforms people are on. Uh, what we thought was we'll put the we'll put the um, just the icon because if you're on it enough, then you'll know what the icon is. So we've got Facebook. It seems like is a really big one, um, and so, so some people are on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Um, if we go over here, okay, YouTube, a lot of people are on. Oh, I'm supposed to put this in present mode. I'm sorry. Um, let me just move this here. We can move. Um, so we're looking at the one with YouTube, some people on TikTok, some people on Snapchat. Nobody's on Vimeo. That's kind of interesting. Um, okay, so we don't have too many people on Quora, but a decent number of people on Reddit and also on Tumblr. That is interesting. Okay, so this question here that we're looking at is um, if you um, regularly visit uh, social media platforms we haven't mentioned to share here. Okay, Instagram. Um, I guess I thought... I thought I had included Instagram. I might not have because Instagram is a little hard to um, to to use as effectively um, to communicate things because you always have to just um, put a picture. But um, that that is an important one. And if I if I forgot to include it, I apologize. Um, all right. Okay, so we're trying to see what social media platforms do your the people that you know who are under thirty use most. Okay, Instagram. <laughs> so that's one that I definitely, I don't know why I forgot to include that one actually, because that that is one that we do have an account on um, as Cureshank. So, and then we see, okay, we have Snapchat, YouTube, but Instagram is the big one here. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a question about like, would you be up for 
going on a new social media platform if it was supposed to improve communication within Phelan McDermott syndrome. And this is kind of what I suspected a little bit um, that, you know, people only have so much time in the day. And so the question is, are you going to get on some on something else? Um, but now it's, I see that it's neck and neck. So <laughs> maybe that'll change. And we're going to take all of these um, results and we're going to, um, you know, analyze them. We're also going to allow um, people who um, are watching the recording to hopefully be able to participate in this poll as well. All right. So this is interesting. Okay. So email is still very much the best way to communicate. Okay. And social media post is second. Um, and then texting, Facebook Messenger, or something else. Okay. Very good. All right, so this is a question about an app, and this is a this is a very uh, cool thing that I'm seeing here. We were thinking about like if there was a, an app that let you track changes um, in various symptoms, would that make you you know help you to more accurately or regularly record uh, uh, requested data? So that this is um, interesting to see. And then this one, would you find it useful yourself for tracking your, your um, loved one's uh, symptoms? And it seems like we're seeing that a lot of people think that it would be useful. That is very good information to hear. And then this part is what, th this is more for our purposes, but um, we're trying to see like, okay, people that are answering these questions, you know, what are the age groups? Because um, then we can try to correlate that to the kinds of answers people are giving by, um, by age group. And also um, as we use, as usually we see in the rare disease community is overwhelmingly female. Um, so, all right, thank you guys so much for your participation. This is gonna be really helpful to us. And um, uh, in the future, um, you know, we might have more surveys. Um, it's really, really useful to get feedback from the community. Um, and so we really, really appreciate it. All right, so now we're to our part of the discussion where we're gonna talk about our, the meat of our 2023, which is bridging the Phelan McDermott syndrome translational research gap. Um, and so for this, I am going to introduce Oh, well, sorry. First, I before I'm going to introduce this infographic. Um, this is meant to be a visual manifestation of what we have done and what we are doing. And um, we're going to talk more about what all of these terms mean and what all of these projects are. Um, but to uh, discuss the uh, first one is uh, Cure Shank, uh, about the Cure Shank. Uh, uh, Biomarkers and Outcome Measures Consortium is Trish Davidson, who is our program director. And I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about her. Um, Trish has a lot of experience developing programs that are meaningful to patients and families. And she has a deep commitment to ensuring a better future for people affected by uh, disorders like Phelan McDermott syndrome. syndrome. Um, for over 20 years, she has developed and directed multi-year patient and professional educational programs and research symposia in, with stakeholders in all sorts of um, uh, areas, health professional organizations, federal government, pharmaceutical industry, nonprofits. She has lots of great experience, and we are so lucky to have her here. And so I'm going to uh, move on to the next slide and uh hand you over to Trish. Thank you, Talia. I appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, good evening, everyone. It's really good to be here with you. And um, I wanted to talk with you about the progress that companies can make when they come together and they focus their efforts. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on the right slide. Sorry about that. Can you go back? Sorry. Okay, great, great. And um, that's why CureShank has established the CureShank Biomarkers and Outcome Measures Consortium. Um, this CureShank consortium model provides a way to bring together companies interested in studying and developing treatments for Phelan McDermott syndrome so that they can pool their talent and their resources um, to ultimately speed the pace of treatment development. 
Next slide. Um, but before we talk about the consortium, I'd like to take a few moments and explain um, the research terms, biomarkers and outcome measures for anyone that may not be familiar with them. Biomarkers are characteristics of the body that you can measure like blood pressure, for example. And unlike some disorders, where you may be able to measure the number of tumor cells or the size of a lesion or the amount of blood sugar. In disorders like phelan McDermott syndrome, it's been more challenging to find direct measures of what's going on in the brain. And that's one reason that getting a group of experts together to pull their talent and resources is important. Next slide, please. And so if we take a look at what an outcome measure is, outcome measures are used in clinical trials to look at a patient before and after treatment is administered. An outcome measure is meant to be an objective way to measure any change or effect or determine progress and look at how well a treatment may work. And so if you think about um, patients or caregivers reporting big improvements during a clinical trial, it may be that the Food and Drug Administration um, will look at those big improvements and still insist on reviewing objective and measurable outcomes data. And so that makes it a difficult task in disorders where individuals can't talk or accurately report how they're feeling. Next slide. So why are biomarkers and outcome measures important? Well, carefully designed clinical trials can provide patients with serious diseases more rapid access to promising treatments. And biomarkers help identify populations for study, monitor a person's treatment response, and identify any side effects. Outcome measures guide treatment decisions and help show improvement. And we want researchers to directly measure what matters most to people, whether it's feeling better or functioning better in a reliable way. So when clinical trials show reliably that benefits outweigh adverse effects, therapies can be recommended with confidence. Next slide. So the consortium that CureShank has established is pre-competitive. And pre-competitive means that companies come together to address shared problems in a way that doesn't impact direct competition. So participating in a consortium gives companies an incentive to work together for mutual benefit. Next slide. So CureShank has established a consortium because we want to enable successful clinical trials. And so a consortium can help enable successful clinical trials in many ways, including identifying solutions faster and making it easier to scale them, pooling resources, tackling shared obstacles, creating universal tools, and working together, most importantly, working together to drive real and meaningful change. Next slide. And just recently, CureShank held a meeting of companies interested in participating in the consortium. And that was on March 22nd. And companies discussed possible projects to undertake. And our next steps are for companies to identify promising projects for 2023 and prioritize those projects. Next slide. Thank you. Um, we're really excited about the progress that has been made in building the consortium. And we're really looking forward to the next steps of identifying the promising projects. And if you have any questions about the consortium, we're happy to answer those. If you'll email consortium, at CureShank.org, we'd be happy to answer your questions. And, and thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Trish. Um, 
it, Trish has done such an, a, a huge amount of work. It's just hard to even describe all of the, the legwork that she's been doing. And we're really, really grateful for her. All right, so then to talk about all of our other uh, uh, projects, um, the consortium of course is our, our biggest one, our most expensive one, but we have lots of other things going on. And so um, for this, um, Geraldine Bliss, whom almost everybody here probably knows, is going to uh, talk about those projects. And um, if, uh, actually I'll just let her introduce herself uh, for anybody that doesn't know her. Um, thanks, Talia. I'm, you know, y'all know me. I'm Geraldine. I'm, my son is Charles. He's uh, 24 years old, and I, I got involved in this in this in kind of research advocacy um, because of him, and especially his challenges with epilepsy. Okay, so let's let's get right into it. Okay, this is sort of the whole vision, as Talia showed you earlier, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of the project or a few of the projects that we're going to do. So I think you can advance it to the next slide. Okay, so as Talia mentioned earlier um, in the meeting, we, we completed our externally led patient focused drug development meeting in November. It was a huge undertaking for us. But beyond that, there was another part of that project and it was to write a report, a meeting report called the Voice of the Patient Report. This is the official document that goes to the FDA. And when the FDA receives applications from companies that want to do clinical trials, or if they're at the point that they're ready to market a drug for the indication of Fallon McDermott syndrome, the FDA would go back to this report and review it and look at what parents and families say about the disease, like what's important to them, what affects, how does the disease impact their quality of life? What is the disease burden and what are the unmet needs? And so that helps them like understand the applications that are coming into them, gives them more context to make their decisions. So I'm very happy to say that last week we completed the report and we submitted it to the FDA and it was accepted that day. So we're very excited we get to officially close the books on the um, externally led patient focused drug development meeting and the voice of the patient report. Okay, so I think the next thing we're gonna talk about is our, um, one of our upcoming projects is going to be a research grant on epilepsy and Fallon McDermott syndrome. Um, we're going to do a second one on developmental regression as well. So epilepsy is a problem that has been especially difficult for my own son. He has over 300 seizures per month. And it's really the reason I got involved in advocacy for research. But despite 20 years of really, really excellent research on Shank 3, we still don't really have a clear, widely accepted, accepted hypothesis about epileptogenesis and Fallon McDermott syndrome. That is, we don't really know what causes epilepsy in people with PMS. Um, one of the challenges has been that almost all of the research that's been done on, the, on Fallon McDermott syndrome has been funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. And because of that, a lot of the research has focused on the way that the loss of Shank 3 causes behavioral changes. Very little funding has come from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. That's the institute that funds most epilepsy research. Um, so we wanna help change that. We wanna kind of change the landscape. And what we wanna do is fund some grants to stimulate additional research on epilepsy and Fallon McDermott syndrome. So our plan is to organize a, a meeting where we would bring in the experts in epilepsy and in Shank 3 and in Fallon McDermott syndrome and talk about what are the research gaps? Why haven't we made more progress in understanding epilepsy? There could be questions like maybe the animal models aren't quite the right animal models. Maybe there are new um, assays or sort of tests that need be, to be administered to the animals to actually determine if they are having seizures. Or there could be other project ideas that are, are suggested. Once that meeting is concluded, we will write a white paper that will sort of outline sort of what the challenges are and what some of the potential ways forward are. And then we'll issue a request for proposals. And our intent is to fund $125,000 in grant money um, to, to understand this problem better. 
The second area that we want to target through sort of a very targeted sort of funding opportunity is developmental regression. And as many of us who are parents know, development is not a, a consistent um, linear path in our children. We see times where they gain skills, times where they lose skills. Sometimes those lost skills are never regained. That has not been very well characterized in Bella McDermott syndrome. We know it happens in the research. We see it happens in probably 40 or 50% of the patients, but it hasn't been well characterized. So we don't know if there are certain developmental milestones during at which children are susceptible to losing skills, if there's a certain age range where they might be susceptible to losing skills or, or other things, we just don't know. So we wanna tackle that problem as, a, as well and we'll follow the same process where we'll bring together the experts, develop a white paper and then uh, announce a request uh, for proposals and um, offer a grant. So our hope is to accomplish both of these big projects this calendar year. We've got a lot of work still ahead of us. Okay, let's, okay. So what am I covering next, Talia? <laughs> um, can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, kind of in parallel, um, we have recently launched a webinar series. This is for investigators and for companies. These are really just, it's a series of workshops to kind of inform researchers um, about resources that might be available to them. We did our first one in February, February, and we had researchers learn about the resources that are available um, to do research with induced pluripotent stem cells through the National Institutes of Mental Health. Um, and we had an investigator who's been working in this field come and talk about some of the work that he's done with Fallon McDermott syndrome um, cell lines from patients with Fallon McDermott syndrome. So we expect to have um, a few more of these workshops this year, and uh, we will create, we'll sort of bank these uh, in a repository of videos that can be referred back to in the future. Okay, and let's go to the next slide. Okay, in addition to the epilepsy grant and the regression grant, we are very pleased to be co-funding a couple of additional projects with the Autism Science Foundation. The first one is, um, it's a sleep measurement study and we're contributing $20,000 for this. The, the intent is to characterize kind of sleep or to, to test a novel device to study sleep at home in children with profound autism. And our funding will enable some patients with Bell and McDermott syndrome to participate in this research study. The second project that we're supporting along with the Fallon McDermott Syndrome Foundation is a study of neuropsychiatric regression. And this is actually using an animal model to model neuroinflammation and neuropsychiatric regression. And that project is being done at Yale. And as I mentioned, co-sponsored by the Fallon McDermott Syndrome Foundation. And let's go to the next slide. Um, we are also, um, one of the collaborative relationships we have is with an organization called Combined Brain. It is a consortium of patient advocacy groups representing disorders that are much very similar to Fallon McDermott syndrome in which there's a severe intellectual disability phenotype. Um, one of the disorders called Angelman syndrome, um, they developed um, kind of a, their research community and they're along with some companies and the patient advocacy groups developed a new instrument called the ORCA, the Observer Reported Communication Ability Measure. And the problem was, like in Phelan McDermott syndrome, most individuals with Angelman syndrome have very kind of low levels of communication abilities. And most standard measures of communication did not capture where the children were starting. So they developed a measure called the ORCA to address that problem. It is scaled sufficiently to sort of the level at which most individuals with Angelman syndrome, what their communication levels are. So the project now is to try to validate the ORCA for use in other neurodevelopmental disorders, including Fallon McDermott syndrome. So we're, we're trying to validate it across 12 other disorders that are somewhat similar. And at the end, 
we're hoping <laughs> that we will have a measure that can be included in clinical trials of family McDermott syndrome. Um, in addition, we really, there's just such great work happening in other places, and we really want to encourage that work and support it in, in ways that we can. And so we have provided some sponsorships for various projects that we think are really important. The Seaver Autism Center um, puts on a really good um, autism conference where they often talk about Bell and McDermott syndrome and Shank 3, so we've supported that. And then last year, the Bell and McDermott Syndrome Foundation helped to organize a very important workshop on gastrointestinal issues. And we provided a sponsorship for that as well. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And we also, where appropriate, we really try to um, support um, advocacy, like legislative advocacy. And so we often sign on to letters that may um, help um, kind of either accelerate treatment, of, uh, the development of treatments for rare disorders like Fallon McDermott syndrome, or maybe enable patients to access um, treatments more easily. On the state level, I recently testified um, in front of the Texas House Appropriations Committee um, on behalf of the, the Project Baby Dillo, which is a, an early screening initiative in which babies in the NICU and the PICU um, would be tested, would, would it undergo genetic testing. Um, and that would enable us perhaps to discover children at younger ages. And then um, hopefully as treatments are being developed, they would be able to access those treatments at younger ages. And let's go to the next slide. And um, Talia, do you wanna take over here? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is your passion project, happy to talk about it, but. Um... Yes, sorry, I was having to unmute myself. Uh, sure, I can take over from here. Um, so yeah, just in continuation of uh, the Real Family Stories project that we started in 2021. Oh, you can't see me, can you? I just I didn't turn my video on. There I am. Um, so in 2021, we made our first Real Family Stories video um, about uh, developmental regression. As I showed you before, we did one on um, uh, self-injurious behaviors and another one on hypotonia. And we have plans to make um, at least two more of them in 2023. Uh, we expect most likely we're going to be doing ones that focus on epilepsy and also that uh, focus on neuropsychiatric uh, illness or regression and just really telling those personal stories um, to really keep the focus on patients and caregivers because it, it so, so often when everybody is looking in the microscope or, um, you know, uh, we're, we're working on getting through the bureaucracy or whatever it is, the, the real people who are impacted by this, um, you know, can get lost. And we just really want to keep the focus there. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, just show you guys on, on this um, uh, diagram that we have here. Um, you see the check box at the the check boxes at the bottom, the conceptual model, the ELPFDD and the voice of the patient, those are completed reports. Um, and, uh, I know that we're a little short on time, but um, Geraldine, do you want to just very briefly explain, you know, this is the translation, what we call the translational research funding gap. You've got basic research that government funds a lot. You've got um, late phase clinical trials that uh, industry like uh, companies fund. Um, but in the middle is that's where we're trying to fill this. And so maybe you can just tell us about uh, some of these categories and all the other things that we just talked about are here represented. You're on mute. Thank you. Basic research tends to be funded by the National Institutes of Health, and normally it's exploring the big abstract questions like, how does learning and memory work? <laughs> um, but once you get into kind of more like looking in at a specific disease and trying to think about how might we make life better for these patients, that begins to fall more into translational research. One part of translational research is drug discovery and design. And that is maybe like looking at animal models and testing different drug compounds or doing experiments to see what might improve the disease state. The other part of translational research tends to be what is more, what kind of gets lumped into a big category called preclinical development. Preclinical development is anything that kind of needs to happen to enable a successful clinical trial. 
Um, and often in that we think about two different components. One is more clinically oriented things, such as the Fallon McDermott Syndrome Natural History Study being done through the Developmental Synaptopathies Consortium. That is truly a clinical trials readiness project where researchers are learning in deep, great detail about the natural history of Fallon McDermott Syndrome so that they can design clinical trials that make sense and where they can actually measure changes. Um, during clinical trials. The other part of preclinical development can include things like Trish was talking about earlier, the development of biomarkers, for instance, that can help enable the success of clinical trials. Um, if, if you proceed, if you are successful in both drug discovery and design and sort of the preclinical efforts, then you may eventually make it to early phase clinical trials. That is a big challenge. It's a very difficult um, task, but we're really fortunate to have some great companies and wonderful academic investigators that have been working really hard to sort of, um, you know, kind of de-risk um, this to enable, I mean, to, to really increase the likelihood that we will have successful clinical trials. Thank you, Geraldine. So the very last part of our uh, presentation is about how you who are here in the audience can help cure Shank's mission. I just saw also in the um, uh, in the Q&A that I had apparently left out one of the age ranges. I'm so sorry about that uh, in our poll everywhere. So um, uh, there are a lot of details to, to get together and I don't know how I missed that. So I do apologize. Um, and I'm sure that we can capture that information at some time in the future. All right, so there are some uh, uh, various ways that you can um, help our mission. The first and most important thing is to stay engaged with what we are doing. If you join the new uh, Facebook group, and we will be sending out a link to that also, but it should be easy to find. It's Phelan McDermott Communications, Cure Shank. Um, uh, uh, if, if you join that group, we are hopeful that that will enable more of our social media posts, if you're on Facebook anyway, to uh, show up in your newsfeed and you'll be more likely to see um, the stuff that we are posting and sharing. Um, also, um, uh, when you see stuff that, that that's going on, please share our stuff. You know, let other people uh, who care about this issue, you know, know what is going on. Um, you know, you can do a part just by doing a very quick share. Um, also participating in surveys like the one uh, that we just did earlier, I said earlier today, earlier this evening, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not always going to be during a webinar, but um, we are, you know, trying to um, figure out, you know, more about how we can reach out to everybody and how we can get uh, information. Also, um, if you have ideas, if you have talents that you want, would like to consider donating or just elbow grease, you're willing to do, you know, just spend a couple of hours helping uh, with, you know, do, do some grunt work or something like that, please let us know. I mean, there are so many different things that uh, we are, um, uh, that, that, that we are in need of help with. Um, and we are, um, for example, you can join the social media team. You can join the community engagement committee um, if that's something that you're interested in. So please always know you can reach out to connect at cureshank.org and we will um, you know, be very receptive to um, uh, what you have to say and uh, offer. Um, the other thing is that we just really do need help with our fundraising efforts. Um, you know, our, our our first fundraiser that we're going to try to do um, is going to be May 3rd. And we know that this is um, a short timeline. Um, we know that, you know, we, we can only do so much. But 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 the thing is that um, we. Uh, OK, so if you looked at if, if, if you think about the totals, like we spent maybe a, a little over two hundred thousand dollars in twenty twenty two. But we are we have much bigger uh, plans for 2023. And then we hope in 2024, we're going to be able to do even more. Um, I mean, eventually we would love to be able to be doing a million or more dollars worth of projects every year. Um, because, you know, the, the purpose of this organization is to put ourselves out of having to have this organization. We are just here, like until we can get you know, treatments going and that, that is our whole, that is our whole purpose. And so, um, we are going to be sharing details very soon about this fundraiser. 
Um, we are calling it a fundraiser because there's a lot of dark things that that go on in our lives. And um, but we, we want to keep it a little bit um, more lighthearted. And it's also going to be science focused. So please um, keep your eye out for that information coming by email and um, also uh, coming uh, through our social media channels. And I should have put on here that like we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, there's other ways that you can give or that you can get money to us without it being necessarily directly from you. Um, for example, employer matching, a lot of times people forget about that. So it's like anytime you happen to donate to us, make sure if your employer matches we should be an eligible organization. Um, and in fact, some companies even um, allow you to designate to give some just a, a certain amount of funds to uh, a, a, an organization, not that you have even done. So like if you, especially if you work for a larger uh, organ, uh, company, that's definitely something that you should um, keep in mind. Um, Facebook fundraisers are great. Um, if you want to do a personal fundraising event, um, we are working on um, ways that we can help you do that. And we are just, we are, we are all ears. Um, we um, also encourage you that it, you know, we know that, that not everybody has a ton of money, but if you think, you know what, I can give a small amount per month, you know, recurring donations, that's something that you can set up to do. So anyway, we are going to be giving you guys more details very soon about this upcoming fundraiser. Um, it's just that um, we were focused so much on getting this webinar together that we, we, we didn't have as many details about that to share uh, as we would have liked. Um, so uh, I think now we are at our Q and A, um, see what time it is. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, but I don't see any question. Oh, let's see, is there a question now? I see a lovely thank you. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that we haven't covered or I don't know. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect that we wouldn't really have too many, uh, uh, too many questions. I think we can close it and thank you to everybody. All right. Well, thank you. Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Talia, for putting this all together. You've worked really, really hard, and uh, we're all super grateful for all that you've done for, for uh, Cure Shank and our community. Um, and thank you to all of our supporters, everybody that's attending and or will be watching this uh, recorded. And uh, don't forget to complete the poll everywhere and join. hopefully you can join our new um, Facebook group. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, now the, all the Q and A's are coming in. Oh, yeah. Wait. Okay. Let's <laughs> see. That's okay. We should end on time. Okay. All right. Bye. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you.